So the Sermon on the Mount. And there's certainly a lot to cover here. All right. So definitely the Sermon on the Mount is related to kingdom living. There's no doubt there's a direct relationship between the two. And we have to talk a little about the kingdom as we talk about the Sermon on the Mount. So if you want to get a really good book that has a chapter on the Sermon on the Mount, this is where some of this material is coming from. It's coming from a book called Kingdom Ethics. Uh, this is the newer edition, the second edition. I have the older edition because I'm old, but they made a second edition. So this is where some of this material is coming from. But that book covers all kinds of ethical issues, not just issues in the Sermon on the Mount covers a wide range of topics, but that's a pretty good book. Uh, I don't agree with every single thing in it, but it's certainly got plenty in there. Very thick book, by the way. So that's a good resource for you if you want to go deeper. So when it comes to the five discourses of Jesus in Matthew, of course, the Sermon on the Mount, chapters five to seven is the first and obviously the longest and the most prominent. Of course, Jesus did a ton of teaching, but this one is, you know, certainly is one of the longer ones. Um, you know, if you just read it all the way through, I mean, that's Jesus just, we, of course, they didn't have chapter divisions back then. It's not like Jesus opened up or he said, all right, I'm going to do Matthew 5 to 7. I mean, no, he just started teaching and then we our chapter divisions were put in later in the Bible to help us, you know, help us as readers. But that's not the way he taught. I mean, he just went right on and just kept teaching right and that's what we have now broke but broken up into chapters so sermon on the mount is very challenging it challenges my faith i've never been able to obviously anyone that can live out the sermon on the mount all the time or tries to we know that it kind of kicks you in the butt a little bit it's hard to it's hard to carry out these these saying or the uh these teachings and you know these kingdom principles kingdom um kingdom ethics, as we say. I mean, it's it's not easy. Now, there's some group of scholars that believe actually the Sermon on the Mount is only applicable in the millennial kingdom. That, uh, you know, it doesn't really have a lot to do in the present. Like this is, this is stuff for the future age when Jesus sets up his millennial kingdom on earth. And this is something that only we can really carry out in that kingdom. Um, of course, a lot of other scholars push back on that and they say, no, 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 it's for the present. It has to be for the present. I mean, we live in this world, so there has to be some principles and some applications for today. Uh, I mean, some obviously it's prescriptive for today. That mean prescriptive mean that we can live it out today. There's principles that we can apply in our lives today. There's actions that we can take. So Sermon on the Mount is as I said, it's definitely related to the realm of the kingdom of God. And these are about practices and behaviors that reflect the kingdom of God. So we definitely need to know a little bit about the kingdom of God before we even, you know, as we start to look at the Sermon on the Mount, we have to understand something about the, the nature of the kingdom. And the breakdown of the Sermon on the Mount, obviously, as I said, Matthew 5 to 7, is that you have the the part about was we'll talk about how we're supposed to be salt and light into the world. Remember, Jesus is speaking to a different audience, right? Once again, he's speaking to those people on that that mountain that day. That's that sermon is addressed to a group of different people, right? Not us, but it's for us, meaning that we can make applications too. But we were not there when Jesus was speaking this. That wasn't the we were not the original audience. But of course, like I said, we can make some applications into our lives as well. So Matthew 5, 17 to 48 discusses the proper horizontal relationships between people. And Matthew 6, 1 to 18 discusses piety and a correct view of God. Of course, that's where you've got the disciples' prayer in there. Sometimes we call it the Lord's Prayer. Matthew 6, 19 to 34 discusses possessions. And then Matthew 7, 1 to 12 discusses condemnation and discernment and judging. And there's more to Matthew 7 after that, of course. So... The Beatitudes, you know, we're talking about the Sermon on the Mount. This is, this is, these things are used to describe this new community that identifies us as believers with Jesus. I mean, this is, 
from the perspective of this brand new thing that Jesus is doing, right? He's ushering in the kingdom. The reign of God is broken into humanity and the Beatitudes really are showing this kingdom is breaking in. Like our behavior reflects that this new kingdom has come, this, this kingdom that Jesus has brought, who's, he started it or inaugurated it. And we are supposed to reflect these kingdom behaviors to show the kingdom has arrived. Now, it's not completed, so I'll talk more about it in a minute, but it has started. Um, this is a really good quote by John Train. He said, John Drain, he says, Jesus is teaching was intended as a way of life only for those people subjected their lives to God's rule. This is the point in which Jesus's ethic has most frequently been misunderstood. People who claim to be able to accept the Sermon on the Mount, but not the claims that Jesus made about his own person have misunderstood the essential character of Jesus's teaching. It is quite impossible to separate his theology from his ethics and to do so destroys both. And so, of course, we believe that Jesus was way more than just like an ethical teacher. It's not just another teacher. I mean, he's the Lord, but there is an ethic behind his teaching, obviously, how we live and how we conduct ourselves on others, how we treat people. So ethics certainly matters and it's part of our faith, but hear me, I'm not just saying like, just because Jesus teaches these things that it's a, uh, you know, I'm just kind of reducing Jesus to be just like a good teacher or something. You know, I don't believe that. Of course, I believe he's the Lord. So there's no doubt that the kingdom is part of uh, the background of this, right? Um, it is the, uh, the, the reign of God has broken in, right, to, into humanity. And as I said, Jesus talks about this and he says, repent for the kingdom of heaven is a ham. And we just have to understand what we mean when we say we're talking about kingdom. I mean, and Jesus is, of course, the inaugurator of the kingdom of God. He's the king. He's the Davidic king. And he is talking about, um, excuse me a second, I'm sorry, I have an issue with my parent here. And when we're talking about kingdom, it isn't just necessarily like a geographical place. We're talking about Jesus's lordship or rule, right? Because God is the king. God is the king of Israel. And he raised up, of course, many kings like the Davidic king. And they weren't actually the Messiah, but they certainly were kings, right? And of course, King David was, you know, had a heart for God, but ultimately David, the Davidic king, King David pointed to a greater king that would come, which is Jesus. And so Jesus is God's son, but he's not just a son, he's the son of God, right? And he is um, the one who inaugurates the kingdom, the actual kingdom of God, okay? So that refers to lordship, rule, reign, or sovereignty. You could say kingship. We come to faith in Jesus, we come under his rule. He becomes our king. It's not just he's just a savior who takes us to heaven. He becomes our king. Now, I doubt many of us, when we preach the gospel to somebody, a share of faith, we're saying, would you like to make Jesus the king of your lives? Most of us are not talking about that with people because it almost sounds too threatening. But the reality of it is that's what we're really asking because people get transferred out of the kingdom of darkness, the kingdom of light. They come under Jesus' reign, even if they don't fully understand it. And then gradually, over time, through discipleship, they they become, uh, you know, we submit ourselves to God, to Jesus' lordship every day. I mean, he, he's we're supposed to be looking to him as the king every day, right? It's not just like a one-time thing. So that's our goal every day, to remember that he's the king of our lives. So that means he calls the shots. Um Sometimes we don't talk about that. Sometimes we just like to talk about him being the savior, right? Which is true, he is a savior, but he's more than a savior. He's the king. So we talk about the kingdom of God, like I showed this chart before. If you look at the already not yet aspect, that's where we live as believers. We're in that middle part right there where it says already, but not yet. Because like I said, the kingdom is broken in, but it's not completed yet. It's not, we're not all the way to the right where it says the restoration of the kingdom and Christ's return is fully realized because Jesus hasn't come back yet. We're, we're in the middle. I mean, the Messiah came, he inaugurated the kingdom, he died, rose from the dead, ascended to the Father, and he started the kingdom of God, but it's not completed. So it hasn't been consummated, as we say. So we're living in that, that tension point, right, in the middle, the already but not yet phase, okay?
All right. Now, what we try to do in this world is as long as we're on this earth, which who knows how long it'll be, whether how long God gives us here or else the Lord comes back, is that we try to give people a taste of the reign of God now or the kingdom of God now. We want to show people a sliver of what the kingdom is like because we know in the future when the Lord is here with, or else we're with the Lord, or else we're with the Lord, else he comes back, it's going to be totally different than what it is now. There's not going to be all these broken relationships and suffering and broken bodies and bodies breaking down and cancer and all this stuff and, you know, hatred and all the other problems we have in our world. It's going to be different. So we try to give people a taste of what the reign of God is like now, the kingdom of God. So whether, you know, when our relationships with others, how we treat people, in our work environments um you know we're trying to be agents of deliverance trying to be agents of change agents of redemption wherever we're at okay so god is using you wherever you are you just your goal should be to give people a taste of the reign of god now now what's it what's that like well you know do we forgive people the way god wants us to forgive do we carry out relationships the way god would want us to are we different are we just just like the world, are we different? You know, do we show people uh, uh, this this foretaste of the kingdom, what it's like now? So that's that's what we try to do in this world. We don't always do it perfectly, obviously, but that would be the goal. Okay. All right. Now, so the kingdom of heaven in Matthew um, is identical with the meaning of kingdom of God. And you just want to think of like the kingdom of heaven as being similar to John's theme of eternal life or what Paul talks about salvation. They're um, quite uh, synonymous as all beings. They're all synonymous with each other. Okay. Because you ask people to think about it. If you ask people if they have eternal life, you're asking them, have they come into the kingdom? Have they made Jesus the king of their lives? Have they come under the reign of God? Have they been saved? It's all pretty much the same thing. Okay, they're all related, right? Um, so the kingdom is more dynamic than geographic. And so, as I said, it's it has a present day application, but also its future as well. One day Jesus will come back and set up his kingdom on earth. So what Jesus does is when he starts teaching in the Sermon on the Mount, he's talking about these kinds of behaviors that he expects from his disciples. You know, we are citizens of the kingdom right and we can't neglect the characteristics of the kingdom so we're talking about the we talk about the beatitudes we're talking about that we are blessed now and jesus starts talking about blessed is he blessed is you know the the blessed part these are promise and rewards that are both in the present in the future uh to those who um display these attitudes right it has a present aspect and then a future as well a future aspect is there as well and one thing that you have to understand that what jesus is going for uh when he's teaching on the sermon on the mouths we'll talk about some of these things in matthew 5 is he's talking about disposition of the heart as well right the your heart the goal is that your heart reflects these principles like your goal but your heart has to be in the right place with the new with the new birth and the holy spirit coming in your life this is it's not just like the teachings that he's giving are not like just a bunch of rules to follow right they are they are they reflect they flow from a change of heart and that's part of the new covenant of course because god gives us a new heart right so the heart in the Bible, of course, represents all of us. It's our emotion, our intellect, our will. Everything comes together. It's holistic. And we are called to, uh, you know, obviously, when we think about these teachings, we are called to, the heart is supposed to be at the center of everything, of course. From out of the heart is what, where these principles will either be a success in our life or they won't be, right? So it has to do with our the condition of our heart. Okay? Of course, there's, uh issues of the hardening of heart in the bible you know sometimes our heart is hardened and sin can harden our hearts bitterness can harden our hearts um unresolved issues and so our heart is not sensitive towards the ways of god and 
you know, obviously, you may generally, if we have a heart and heart, the only cure is repentance. Um, we can harden our own hearts. You know, we can circumstances of life harden us sometimes, and we need to ask God to obviously dissect us continuously and help us to have a sensitive heart towards Him. Right? Okay. So when you think about blessedness, um, that's not necessarily. It's not, just, not something that's supposed to be seen as a reward for like religious accomplishments, but being blessed is an act of grace in like believers' lives, an act of God in, in your life. Okay. It's a sense of it's a sense of contentment you have from experiencing God's favor. Okay. And we start with understanding the Sermon of the Mount. The starting point is understanding that we're forgiven through what Messiah has done for us, and that should just overflow in our hearts a sense of gratitude because of God's favor towards us in doing that, right? Saving us and reconciling us towards him, uh, to him to through the Messiah. Um, so let's look at some of these, uh, these sayings in the uh, Matthew 5 text. You may want to have your uh, Bible in front of you. Just give me a second here. I have to fix something here real quick. Okay, when Jesus talks about the poor in spirit in Matthew 5, that uh, we need to understand that he's talking about not just uh, the economically poor, obviously Jesus was concerned about that, but being poor in spirit means that you're spiritually humble, right? It's not arrogance, it's the opposite of being arrogant, and when you look up the Brown uh, Driver Briggs lexicon, Hebrew lexicon, they talk about poor as being, um, it means to be powerless, needy, humble, lowly, pious, where, you know, the person that comes to faith in the Messiah, as you know, has to be poor in spirit. I mean, we don't come to God in an, with an arrogant spirit, right? God looks upon the contrite of heart those that don't realize that realize how great he is and how small they are right nobody comes to faith through arrogance so we need to understand our position before god right that we need to have a a humble needy disposition towards him right being poor in spirit okay and when he talks about blessed are those who mourn for they shall be comforted um that's like being poor in spirit but it kind of has more of a double meaning it can mean grief or sadness of those who've lost someone right but it also has to do with repentance okay when we're contrite over our sin and we're poor you know we come to god mourning you know for the, whether it be the sin of our own whether it be our own sin or the sins of community and we want to deal with that. I mean, obviously, repentance has to do with a broken heart. But, you know, we mourn over our sin. You know, you guys probably have read, if you've ever read the book of Daniel, you know, Daniel gets before God on his knees and calls out to God for forgiveness for the sins of Israel, right? He's broken over that. And he just, uh, you know, he, he's, he's pouring himself out to God. I think it's in Daniel chapter 6 over the sins of Israel. And so, so does Nehemiah, by the way, in the book of Nehemiah, if you read the beginning of Nehemiah. So this has to do with repentance, you know, it has to do with mourning, right? And, and of course, God comforts us in that. So it's kind of related to being poor in spirit. There's the kind of relationship between the two. Now, when it comes to uh, the meek thing, you know, blessed are the meek for they shall inherit the earth. This is interesting because this is kind of interesting. I think some people think like being meek has to do with like being like a doormat, just letting people ride right over you or take advantage of you or just uh, being really unassertive and being kind of gullible and, and just so gentle to the point that, you know, people just uh, run right over you. I don't think that's what Jesus is doing there. Um, it definitely can be, can be related to being humble or gentle, but it doesn't mean necessarily we're called to be mild or unassertive, right? Um, you can look at some of these other people, you know, in the Bible, like Moses and Jesus, you know, they, I see them as being humble or gentle, but I also see them as being direct 
speaking the truth in love and and you know being fearless you know and they were fully surrendered to the will of god obviously so just remember that when you when you think of uh being fearless that or being meek and that you've got to be um you've still got to be you know firm okay so i don't really uh i see i see, when i think of jesus you know we don't have a recording of the way he talked we don't have any videos of his tone but i see him being coming across as humble and gentle with people but i also see him being i i can see him being very assertive and very truthful and being firm paul of course was like that you can read it more in paul so i don't really um buy into this um kind of like sweet and gentle Jesus all the time. Like he's just so, um, you know, he, uh, he, some of these pictures and videos, you know, and just the cultural way of viewing him that he, you know, kind of like Jesus is just all about love and that's all he is. You know, he just, Jesus is just love. So that's just a misunderstanding. You know, of course he was loving, but he spoke the truth and love as I've talked about before. So he's the embodiment of truth and love, right? Okay, now, Barney Jesus, right, Steve, exactly. I call him Barney Jesus, right? That's what people think he's like Barney the dinosaur. Um, now, it talks about righteousness. Jesus about thirsting for righteousness, right? You guys familiar with that? So there's this, this aspect in Paul's book of Romans. We think of like imputed righteousness or God imputes Christ, Jesus' righteousness to us. But this is a little different what Jesus is talking about there here in Matthew 5. He's speaking to Jews, of course. He's talking about the, the aspects of righteousness in the framework of the Torah or the, the law, right? The first five books of the Bible and the teachings there and the relationship between God and the Torah they were given, like Moses, you know, receiving the Torah. And that kind of was the center of their existence, right? The Torah. So he's talking about the relationship of covenant and community. When he's thinking, talking about righteousness. So Righteousness has to do, of course, with preserving the peace and wholeness of community, preserving the shalom. Um, it can, it, it certainly has an aspect where it can be related to social issues where people are being treated um, incorrectly and there's like a lack of justice, right, and oppression. Like God wants us to do righteousness, like he wants us to act righteously and not be, um, not to be unjust, right? We want to be people of justice and fairness, right? So when we're thirsty for uh, justice, you know, that uh, restores a covenant community, that's part of being righteous. Now, God is righteous, of course, by his nature, he is righteous, okay? And we, um, we must uh, deal, we must, of course, we're called, to, we're not God, we can't obviously, we're not the judge, and we definitely have... Um, issues with uh trying to be righteous right we have to understand we're not god right we can't judge the we're not ones to judge the outsider the people outside of the community people in the outside culture don't believe in him that's his job to judge them right god judges the insider he judges the insider first he judges the church first as first peter talks about but we're called to reflect you know, being people, how we treat people, right? Being people of justice and fairness and being righteous, okay? Um, so, okay, anyway. Now, mercy is an interesting one. When Jesus talks about mercy. And mercy is actually um, certainly an action, you know, and... It has to do with delivering someone from some kind of bondage, right? When we talk about mercy in the Gospels, you know, when you read about mercy, it can mean forgiveness that delivers the person from bondage or guilt. And it's an action of deliverance in the sense of healing or forgiving. You know, it talks about blessed are those who, like God, offer compassion and action, forgiveness, healing, and aid and covenant steadfastness to those in need. And we need to, of course, act mercifully. God is a God of mercy, right? We should be merciful to people. And 
we are called to be merciful. But, of course, we don't do it perfectly like God does. But, uh, you know, some people, I don't know about you guys, but sometimes I look at other Christians and some of them seem to have more of a, um, of course, it's talked about spiritual gifts. Sometimes mercy is a spiritual gift. And, you know, some people are easier, uh, have an easier job at being merciful than others. I Sometimes it takes a lot more work. You know, we, you know, try, some people are very natural about being merciful to other people. Some people, it takes a little more work. It just depends. Um, I think some people are having an easier time showing mercy when they realize God has shown them mercy, right? When you've experienced mercy, you're going to tend to want to extend mercy to others. It's going to be a lot easier to extend mercy, right? When you've been shown mercy, right? So it just depends on your situation. I know that people that where God has really poured out his mercy on them when they were in a very bad situation and God definitely showed up and showed them mercy that they're more apt to pour out mercy to others, right? And sometimes it's just life circumstances that, you know, obviously we're able to give people um, that we go through life circumstances that empower or just prepare us to show mercy to others, right? Um, so, you know, if similar as the bottom, like the bullet, bull, the bottom bullet point here, it'd be like saying, blessed are those who like God offer compassion and action, forgiveness, healing, and aid and, and aid and covenant steadfastness to those in need. Okay. All right. And what about the pure in heart? Blessed are those who are pure in heart. Well, being pure in heart, as I said, I talked about the heart, right? The heart is your disposition before God, God begins to transform our heart as soon as we come to faith in him because we're given the Holy Spirit and we have the new covenant. It's a change of our hearts. And we are called to give ourselves to an all-encompassing orientation towards God who creates all and therefore also, um, therefore also is pure, right? Because God is perfectly pure. And we are called to give our whole self to God, right? A fully devoted heart towards God. That's what God desires of us. We don't always do it perfectly. But, you know, we know that, uh, I think we probably know when we are reflecting that purity, when we're pure in heart. I mean, when, you know, our heart wants to do the right thing. You know, King David was a man after God's own heart. Obviously, he blew it tremendously, but we attempt to obviously live a heart of purity towards God. Um, it's a daily thing, of course. We have to constantly strive for this, right? It's not something that happens automatically. Now, and he says, blessed are the peacemakers, for they should inherit the kingdom of God. Um, you got to remember in Jesus' time, they had the zealots, and they were a Jewish sect who was... Uh, a bunch of Jewish revolutionaries who wanted to overtake Rome, right? They were the ones that wanted to bring the kingdom by violence, okay? And they obviously got squashed for doing it several times. But, you know, Jesus, they wanted Jesus to kind of do the same thing at times. They thought maybe he was just going to do everything through force. And Jesus didn't do that, of course, right? He was the opposite. And they... Uh, the, this group of Jews were still around after Jesus left. They tried to lead a revolt against Rome after he was gone, and they got squashed again. Um, and they had a rabbi leading them named Rabbi Kiva, and they got all killed, slaughtered. But Jesus is talking about he doesn't want that. You know, he doesn't want to bring the kingdom through force. He doesn't want to bring it through violence. It's done through a change of heart right it's not through the destruction of your enemies so we don't obviously want anyone to believe through force you know we don't want to force anyone to believe when i'm on a campus i get so many students that always assume that we're trying to force people to believe something like you're out here forcing your beliefs on others and you know the reality of it is is I always tell them you can always believe whatever you want to believe i don't you don't have to believe whatever you, you don't have to believe what i'm saying so nobody's forcing anything we're just giving you the information. You can do with it whatever you want. It's your it's your freedom and your choice. So anyway, so we are called to be shalom makers. You know, shalom is that Hebrew word for peace. We are try 
we are trying to make pe trying to be peacemakers and set the example. We don't want to be known as people who are overly divisive and contentious and cause broken relationships ever everywhere we go and cause destruction. And every time people think of us, they think of some sort of contentious, divisive, difficult person. Um, hopefully people see us as being able to be an agent of change and peace, right? We can bring, actually, we can help relationships. We can have help people reconcile. We can help difficult situations be resolved because we just have a different view. We know that re reconciliation and peace is always, can always bring about the best result if it's possible, right? So we're supposed to be different in that area, okay? Now, remember that uh, when Jesus is teaching on this stuff, that he's not saying things that are totally unheard of. Like, it's not like his, the concepts he's talking about, the Sermon on the Mount, is not anywhere in the prophets. Like, when you read the prophets, right? Um, there's a lot of stuff in the prophets about being righteous, about righteousness and justice and suffering and all kinds of things. Um, but obviously, you can't be politically correct and try to follow Jesus. It doesn't work, right? You you have to be willing to sometimes suffer because of your covenant loyalty to God. And, you know, we have to understand that we are not always going to be able to follow. We can't please everybody and follow Jesus. You guys know that. You, you're going to, one day you don't answer to anyone else. You answer to God anyway. You answer to Jesus. So you're not going to answer to your friends or peers or coworkers or anybody else. So you really can't follow the Lord and follow the world. Um, it's never worked, as you know. And we try to try to make us fit together because we're insecure and we want popularity. We generally pay the price, right? Okay, so when he says here, you know, one of the best teachings of the Sermon on the Mount or one of the most important ones, he says, you are the salt of the earth. But if salt loses its flavor, how can it be made salty again? It's no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled on by people. You're the lie of the world. A city located in a hill cannot be hidden. People do not light a lamp and put it under a basket on a lampstand. It gives light to all the house in the same way. Let your light shine before people so they may see your good deeds and give honor to your Father in heaven. So notice how Jesus says here, he says, you are the salt of the earth and the light of the world. He says, this is what you are. It doesn't say you kind of are. It doesn't say you should think about it. He says, you are the salt of the earth and the light of the world. Now, he's saying this to his original audience here, right? He's not speaking to, we weren't there, but the application is to us because we are his followers, right? So we are the salt of the earth and the light of the world. That's the way Jesus sees us. He doesn't say, you're kind of the salt and kind of the light. He says, no, this is what you are now because you're identified in me. And that means that, we think of salt and light where we should think of like an alternative community that's different from the world right that ref that is salty um we do things differently our behaviors are different we our relationships are different we are we are we need to be rubbing off on people not having people rub off on us right you're either rubbing off on them or they're rubbing off on you and some of us, I'm sure, in challenging work environments or places where people don't believe what we believe, there's a lot of unethical and immoral things around us. Different things we hear every day, whether it be language, whether it be beliefs, whether it be um, just conforming to images of the world. And we, we're we trying to be salt where we are. That's why we try to be salt and light in our work environments, right? And obviously, you can't be light if you're withdrawn and hidden. You, you can't be light in the midst of darkness if you're totally hiding, right? And that's why sometimes we have to go into those dark places and be a light. And Jesus calls us to be that light, whether it be a difficult environment, might be a difficult relationship, but one way or the other, we can't shine the light of the Lord if we're just totally withdrawn and hidden, right? Um, they have to be able to see us. We have to be visible. Okay. Now we know that salt in the scriptures is associated with purity. It's associated with covenantal loyalty. It's associated with sometimes an element to be added to sacrifices, depending on the context of the Levitical sacrifices. And of course, it's a seasoning for food. 
I'm not much of a salt guy myself, although I like salt on my tomatoes. That's about it. Like I cut a tomato and put the salt on it. That's about the only time I ever eat salt. But anyway, so these are some of the things we want to associate salt with. Definitely purity and covenantal loyalty is probably what we want to be going for here, right? And when we become tasteless, he talks about becoming tasteless. It really is equivalent of becoming foolish. Um, it's similar to what Jesus is talking about in Matthew 7. If you guys read the end of Matthew 7, he talks about the wise men who built his house upon the sand or upon the foundation, right, of the foundation of Christ. When we become tasteless, we just become foolish. We really don't, we're not built, we're not showing that we're building our faith on the foundation of the Lord, right? And we need to, um, when we lose our saltiness, we lose our identity. Our identity in the Lord doesn't reflect to others. We're just really letting the world conform us to its image, right? We're letting the cultural changes and the, the things that are really cool in culture to conform us to its image, right? We just crave being like the culture, whether it be body image or success, popularity or sexual things, whatever it is. So we have to be really careful that we don't lose our saltiness. Um, you know, sometimes this can happen with language where sometimes you're around a lot of people that swear, prof you know, profusely in your environment. Sometimes it rubs off on you and then you just start talking like them, right? And we, st we stop being different. You know, people, we're not rubbing off on them. They're rubbing off on us, right? And uh, so that's the goal. You know, we want to be salty, okay? So... I want you to take a giant salt maker wherever you go and just remind yourself when you're not being salty, just pull off your head and shake it, you know, on the top of your head, you know, and say, I'm becoming more salty. It's a bad joke. Anyway, now, as I said about light, God is light, as we know. He is not darkness. He is light. And Israel was and is called to be a light to the nations, right? They were supposed to reflect the knowledge of God to the world around them. They're supposed to show the light of God. And of course, light penetrates darkness. Now, we become believers, of course, we become light as well, right? We're supposed to spread the knowledge of God when people see us walk into a room, when people see us around other people. People generally sometimes, we rub off and they see the light. They're like, what is it about you? You seem so different. There's something about you, you know, that I see the light in you. You know, and sometimes people can sense it, right? We're really walking with the Lord and we're really in prayer and in the word and uh really sensitive to god's god's ways and trying to follow the lord our light will reflect on others okay all right now when he talks about being when he talks about the part about being on a hill um disciples are sitting on a hill in matthew 5 14. the background of that is isaiah 2 uh verses 2 to 5 where Disciples are a city on a hill, but we're only a city on a hill if we have to invite people up the hill, right? We want people to invite people into this new community, right? Into this new kingdom community, okay? Now, by the way, when it talks about shining your light, that's a, um, that's more of an active verb. It's not passive, okay? It, there's a relationship between doing the deeds, you know, that uh, let our light shine. You know, I had a friend say to me once, I was having a hard time reaching my family. I was I was getting a lot of pushback from my family, but what I believe this is so many years ago. And he said, just the best way to reach your family is let your light shine before them so they may see the good deeds you do and reflect your Father in heaven. They look at what you do more than what you say at this point. Your words don't have enough credibility with them, Eric, because... You have to, they don't really know if this thing's really real in you. They have to see it over the long haul. And so I had to try to live out my faith in front of them for several years before I got credibility, some credibility, okay? So actions do matter, definitely. Beliefs matter too, but actions matter, reflects, reflect what we believe. Now, so he talks about blessed are the pure in heart. Um, as I said, there are passages, Psalm 24, Psalm 73, one that speaks of clean hands and a pure heart. They shall see God. That means that, you know, we, when we're doing these things, we will experience the presence of God in our lives, right? And 
God is going to be more visible to us, more his presence is going to be stronger. I don't mean we're definitely going to see him, but his presence will definitely be stronger in us when we are practicing these things. His presence will be more evident in our lives and he will seem more real to us. He talks about Matthew uh, 5, 21 to 26 about being angry. Um, that's not really, it's not a command, but like a part, participle of an ongoing action. Um, let me see something here real quick. I just want to see the, that passage. I just want to look at one thing here. Don't mind me. So, let me see here. To 21... Yeah, when he says here, Matthew 21, you have heard it said to the people long ago, you shall not murder. Of course, murder is hatred in your heart in the Bible as well. It's not like killing somebody physically, um, necessarily always killing someone, right? And anyone who murders will be subject to judgment. I tell you that anyone who's angry with the brother or sister will be subject to judgment. Okay, so, you know, it, anger is obviously, you know, the Bible is not against like a righteous anger. You know, God does get angry in a righteous way because his holiness is being violated, right? And his justice comes out. But it's a different thing. It's a different kind of anger. It's um, the kind of anger Jesus is talking about is where you probably get so angry to the point where it turns into a, uh, a total bitterness and a very insulting anger that comes out with insulting words, obviously. And it destroys relationships. Um, it's like a sinful anger. It actually kills someone. You can just murder someone with your words, right? So it's the opposite of peacemaking, right? That's why the Bible talks about, you know, not, you know, talks about anger. You know, it's, it's against a certain kind of anger. It's not against all anger. Like when I, when some of us saw 9-11 happen, we were probably angry, right? We we're like, we we're angry because this is happening. Like a righteous anger came out of us. Like, this is wrong. Like, we want justice for this. You know, God, can you bring justice to this situation? This is totally wrong what's happening, right? So there's a sense where there's an anger that's an acceptable anger, but then there's the wrong kind of anger, and that's the one Jesus is against, right? So, you know, we have been given a, um, the Holy Spirit, we have been given a transforming initiative where we should be able to be different in conflict resolution. Most relationships are destroyed because of lack of conflict resolution, right? And we should set the example of the ones who can set this new pattern that replaces the wrong pattern. You know, we can come into a situation and say, you know, this is how the situation is resolved. You know, what can we do to get it resolved? We have a conflict here. We have a, a better way. And so hopefully we can practice that as peacemakers, right? We have we can show that to other people. Now, Jesus talks about adultery um, in Matthew 5, 27 to 30. You've heard it said to you, you shall not commit adultery. But I tell you, anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with his heart. If your right eye causes you to stumble, gadget it out and throw it away. It's better for you to lose one part of your body, your whole body to be thrown into hell. If your right hand causes you to stumble, cut it off and throw it away. It's better for you to lose one part of your body, your whole body going to hell. So I know everybody here, when they first read this passage, they thought they were supposed to go out and literally cut their eye out, right? And cut off their hand, right? Because you did not know what hyperbole was at the time. And you thought that Jesus was being hyper literal. That when I first read that, I thought, as a new believer, I thought, is he talking about cutting off my hand? He can't surely be saying that. I mean... Everybody walking around with their hands cut off and their eyes gouged out. Um, of course, I was biblically illiterate at the time, so I didn't know what the hyperbole was. But now, of course, I'm a little more mature, I understand. But the point is that Jesus is really serious about adultery, you know, sexual sin. And also our eyes, of course, adultery can be not physical, right? I mean, if we... There's nothing wrong with obviously acknowledging somebody is a beautiful person, in the image of God, like this person is an attractive person, whatever. There's nothing wrong with acknowledging that, right? The problem is where there's a line drawn in our mind, where we, we all know where that line is, where it turns from that appreciation of beauty into a um, 
a lust, a sexual lust, right? Where we start physically thinking about things we shouldn't be thinking about, right? We, those, those thoughts go into fantasies and dreams, right? And adultery starts with a lonely heart sometimes. It starts with fantasy. And it starts with uh, a mind that's wandering. And so we have to catch ourselves, obviously. We have to keep our eyes open and be alert, right? We have to be mentally alert. But it's around us all the time. It's a battle because the whole culture is sexualized. And we know that all of social media is very sex sexualized. And everything's very physical. Everything's image. It's about image. It's about all that stuff. So it's very hard. But uh, Jesus is very serious. And he talks about plucking your eye out, cutting your hand off. He's, he's talking about getting serious about this issue. That's why he talks about the hell issue and using that as a warning, you know, that, you know, you should take this very seriously. You know, don't just walk around like, oh, whatever, you know what I mean? Like, I just, uh, I'm just going to go ahead and just be adulterous all the time in my mind. Um, and then, you know, whatever that leads to. Of course, adultery can be physical. You can obviously commit adultery on somebody, your spouse, but it can start, it can just be in your mind. Um, so now when Jesus talks about divorce, uh, he goes on to, he says in verse 31, it has been said, anyone who divorces his wife must give her a certificate of divorce. So I tell you, anyone who divorces his wife, except for sexual immorality, makes her a victim of adultery, and anyone divorce marries a divorced woman commits adultery. So there's not like a hundred Bible passages on divorce in the Bible. There's not a ton there. There's this passage. And of course, Jesus talks about Matthew in Matthew 19, three to eight is another passage. And he's referencing back to Deuteronomy 24 verses one to two, where divorce is permissible in Jewish context, because there was a, there was a passage. There's some pa verses about where divorce is permissible in some cases in, in cases to protect the wife. Right. And of course, adultery comes from pornania. That's what that that word comes. You know, it it means it's like sexual immorality. Um, and you know the it, so the problem today, of course, is the debate over um, whether the uh, the divorced husband causes a divorced wife to commit adultery when she remarries, um, or the new husband is also an adulterer and he marries a divorced woman. So. Yes, once again, there are so many different views within Christian circles about divorce and remarriage that uh, you can get this book, Divorce and Remarriage, for Christian Views, because there isn't one view, um, hasn't been for a while. Um, but, you know, the different views out there, you know, different churches have different views, pastors have different views, theologians have different views, scholars have different views. Um, one, of course, view is that Christians must never divorce and never remarry, period. Um, that means that if you're getting abused by your spouse, getting beat to death or verbally abused or mentally abused, you just stay in the marriage and just suffer miserably and uh, maybe end up dead. You know, you just never, you can't get divorced, okay? And you definitely can't remarry. Uh, second view is divorce is permissible for adultery uh, reasons, obviously, like Jesus talks about, or desertion, but remarriage is not possible. So someone could commit adultery on their spouse, but still remarriage is not possible. Or if they leave the spouse, like they just disappear, like I'm done, they leave, but still remarriage is impossible. Third view is divorce is permissible for adultery and desertion, and rem remarriage is permissible for the innocent party. I'd say that is a very popular view in Christian circles today, that if a spouse commits adultery on somebody or they desert the spouse, they leave them, then remarriage is possible for that, that other party. That's I'd say that's a very common view. Fourth view is that uh, divorce is permissible for adultery, being deserted, abuse, and in other special, second, uh, special circumstances, and remarriage is permissible for the innocent and those who are repentant. Um, so I would generally hold mostly the three and four. Um, I, uh, I do believe divorce is permissible in a situation of abuse if the spouse is not repentant and they are abusing the other spouse then there is a possibility for divorce there if they won't go get counseling try to change your behavior or something and the other spouse is just getting abused 
then I don't think that's God's will for that person to stay in that relationship. Um, of course, other people disagree. They think that you could go ahead and be abused to death, and it doesn't matter because you got to stay in that marriage. I do not think that is the case, and I've seen people have been abusive relationships. So, um, but Christians differ, and everybody is still brothers and sisters in the Lord, but there's different views, okay? Um, but the one goal that you have to remember is that God always desires reconciliation, restoration. That's what he ultimately desires, okay? He doesn't, no, he doesn't like divorce, obviously, but he desires always for restoration, reconciliation, if it's possible. Um, but there's a lot of different situations, a lot of circumstances, a lot of delicate, messy situations that I'm aware of that um, aren't so cut and dry and are clean and clean and uh so cut and dry so they're black and white as we say so you'd have to study that book and see a position you take but obviously churches and pastors take different views on this some of the christians as i said and leaders have stick to number one no matter what um, some very hold strongly number two some believe number three and some believe a combination of three and four okay um, there are couples who have had adultery, but they did reconcile and they stayed together and God certainly blessed them. Um, so restoration happened, you know, can happen. Um, so it's just, uh, it's a very, very delicate situation, but you know, you can study, get that book and study different views if you want. Okay. Now, uh, about those vows that Jesus talks about Matthew 5, 33 to 37, you know, and he says here, that uh, again, you've heard this said to the people on ago, do not break your oath, but fulfill the Lord the vows you have made. But I tell you, do not swear an oath at all, either by heaven or as by God's throne or by the earth, for it is your footstool or by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. And do not swear by your head, for you cannot make even one hair black or white. All you need to say is simply yes or no. Anything beyond this comes from the evil one. You've heard it said to you, eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. Uh, well, no, I'm not getting that. I'm talking about verses 33 to 37. So, yeah, the vows that Jesus is talking about here are the pledges that before God and in, um, the things that are required of him or her, right? They're the oaths, the, uh, the oaths they communicate about their truthfulness and could be counted on, right? Because truth-telling is very um, a strong characteristic of the breaking of the kingdom of God, right? We want to be people that are truth tellers right and so we don't want to be deceitful like the father of lies so we make these vows before god of course and how we treat people so they're very serious okay and uh let me um yeah let me emphasize the last couple things here so in matthew 7 uh when jesus talks about I'm skipping to Matthew 7 and Matthew 5 when, you know, that whole passage about the, um, the foundation, or in Matthew 7, let me look here at that real quick. Go ahead and skip ahead on my passage here. When Jesus is talking about, let's see here, 21 to 23. Yeah, and he says here, not everyone says to me, Lord, we'll enter the, we'll enter the kingdom of heaven, but only those who does the will of my Father is in heaven. Many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name, and your name drive out demons, and your name perform any miracles, and I tell them, plan I never knew you, apart from me, you evildoer. Go apart, get, a, get away from me, you evildoer. So, you know, obviously our actions show what we really believe. You know, we, we can say we believe certain things, which beliefs are extremely important because our actions flow from our beliefs. We don't need to divorce the two from each other. I really can't stand it when... Christians just say, all that matters is what you do. It doesn't matter what you believe. That's completely erroneous. Um, what you believe reflects what you do. What you do reflects what you believe. They go together. You can't, your beliefs definitely impact your actions, right? Because you if you strive to have correct beliefs, you would have correct actions, right? So when we reflect what, what you know, what we, when we do reflect what, who Jesus is, obviously that, um, that will definitely show that we are really a disciple. Obviously, we don't do it perfectly, but how we live out and uh, live out our ethic is extremely important. And 
when Jesus says here in Matthew 7 about judging, he says, judge not lest you be judged. You know, Matthew 7, 1 to 5, you guys familiar with that passage? A lot of Christians, of course, assume that this means that we're not allowed to make judgments. Christians are very confused about this. It just comes from not reading it in context. But, you know, we know what Jesus is talking about there. He says that you don't judge, you don't hold someone to a standard that you're not meeting yourself, right? You need to pluck your eye out. If you're not meeting the same standard you're calling them to, then you need to pluck your eye out, right? Because, or, um, you know, you need to definitely, as he says here in Matthew 7, you have to remove the, the, the speck from your eye, right? Remove the speck in your own eye before you try to remove the plank in someone else's eye, right? Not pluck your eye out. Sorry, I'm thinking of Matthew 5. So we are called to, before we make a judgment on somebody else and holding them to standard, we have to make sure we're meeting that own standard ourselves, right? And we certainly could do a lot better on that, um, you know, before we just start, start running around acting like we're completely got it together in one area when we're not even meeting the standard ourselves. So that's what he's talking about there. He's not saying you can't make any judgments. You have to make judgments every day. You can survive without judgments, right? If I say transgenderism is wrong, it's, I think it's wrong. That's a judgment. I'm not being judgmental, okay? That's not being judgmental. That's just making a judgment. I think the evidence shows that it's very destructive towards somebody's body, towards their, toward their lives, and I'm, trying, I'm just making a judgment. If I say abortion's wrong, that's a judgment, right? But if I start condemning people and saying that you're not doing this thing in your life that you should be doing, but then I'm not doing that same thing, then I'm being judgmental, right? If I say to someone, you know, you need to really, really watch your swearing, you know, as a believer, you swear an awful lot, but then I'm swearing all the time, then obviously I can't, can't judge them for that, right? So whatever it is, you have to be careful you're not meeting, you're meeting that standard, right? All right. Well, having said that, those are kind of some of the highlights of the uh, the kingdom of God or the uh, Sermon on the Mount. I can't go over every single line, but I thought that was a good starting point um, on some issues. It looks like we all have some uh, comments here. Uh, OK, yes, I will upload this video. I always do uh, to. Uh, you asked me if I upload this video. Yes, I will. Uh, so regarding the kingdom. Oh, that's a direct message. Sorry. I'll get to that in a minute. Okay. So um, anybody want to talk about anything? Any questions? Did I hit? 